Hello and welcome to The Arise interview where we take time to reflect on the big stories from the news and on the fortunes and affairs of the world in an hour of conversation with commentators, analysts and thought leaders. I'm Charles Anyegolu. Coming up in the next 60 minutes as Nigeria and the rest of the world mark Teachers Day with awards and muted ceremonies honoring the people that have been called superheroes and nation builders by the United Nations. We ask, why are teachers, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, no longer respected today, as they used to be in the 50s and 60s, with many complaining of low job satisfaction and even lower pay? And later, as schools prepare to reopen in Nigeria after several months of closure due to the coronavirus pandemic, amid concerns that the rate of infections in the country could soar as a result, the Academic Staff Union of Universities, or ASU, representing lecturers, say their strike, which has been on since March, continues regardless. We'll speak to the Nigerian Minister of State for Education about this and about World Teachers Day and the continuing complaints that teachers are poorly treated in this country. Coming up. Now, every year on the 5th of October, the world celebrates World Teachers Day, which focuses on individuals who devote their energies to educating billions of students and turning them into productive citizens. The day has been marked since 1994 to commemorate the day that UNESCO and the International Labour Organization signed the recommendation setting forth the rights and responsibilities of teachers and what their status ought to be, as well as the minimum standards for training of teachers and the conditions for learning. Well, Nigeria has been one of the countries marking the day with awards and parades for individual teachers who often go unrecognized for the important work they do. Let's take a look at some of the events that took place earlier in the Nigerian capital, Abuja.
Well, for more on World Teachers Day, I'm joined now in the studio by the Nigerian Minister of State for Education, Chiku Emeka Mwajioba. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. Good evening, sir. Long, busy day for you, Good I evening, take it? Good evening, fellow Nigerians, yes. <laughs> and uh, happy anniversary, by the way, because I'm told that it lasts the whole, the rest of the year. So even though it's October the 1st. Yes. Um, how, how is, uh, sorry, you were going to say something. I'm saying... Uh, Exactly. Um, happy 60th anniversary to sure. every Nigerian. Uh, Nigeria has made huge uh, leaps over the last 60 years, and um, we expect to do even greater as we move ahead. Well, we certainly hope so. Yes. Let's start with today, though. How is World Teachers' Day being marked in Nigeria? Uh, World Teachers' Day has, uh, for the past one week, been, um, we've actually followed with a, a series of programs, actually starting way just a little bit above a week now. Because on the 25th of uh, September, we had a world press conference where we addressed um, the world on what we and UNESCO following the 1994 declaration and the subsequent amendment to that in 1997 um, felt that teachers need uh, some sort of recognition. Mm. Uh, not just because the, the way I keep saying it, that not just because their reward is in heaven, but actually their wages should be actual. I mean, so while I draw the distinction between reward mm -hmm. and wages, I, I, I am part of the committed few who would want the teacher status to be actually a bit more elevated than it is right now, mm. which is what the president has responded to uh, following the entreaties from the Ministry of Education and has widely... Um, uh, if you listen to Malam Adamadamu, the Minister of Education, and the announcement he made today relative to what the President had initiated for them is exactly what we've been trying to pan out in the last one week. Because um, in the one, last one year, we immediately joined the Minister of Education and we, uh, some of these incentives were things we think had with at last year's uh, World um, uh, Teachers' Day. And then uh, to turn them into policy mm. who, who is what uh, Malam Adamadamu reeled out exactly. So we've worked up seriously around trying to bring the teacher uh, prof teaching profession to the height that it actually should be. Right. Oh, well, I mean, it, it's interesting that, that you say that, because I was going to ask you um, to help us take stock of the achievements of teachers under the Buhari administration, which you obviously serve, because for the most part, we hear a lot about strikes and monies owed and unpaid, that sort yes. of thing. Um, a great point, really, because um, we started out with uh, the education sector almost uh, some sort of lethargy. Mm. And um, when uh, in the first part of the administration, the, um, the ministry under the leadership of um, the Minister of Education, Malam Adaman, convoked a presidential uh, uh, retreat on the matter and uh, designed a, a, a blueprint for where we're going with this. Mm. You're correct. Some of the notable issues were uh, we had a lot of out-of-school children. Principally because there were no teachers, really, because uh, I've had cause to interact with a lot of uh, MS and people in the North who say they can't find teachers in the classroom. In some cases, and not in a lot of cases, uh, teachers were inadequate. Mm. Those who were available, ill-trained and not uh, ill-equipped for the job. The few who were actually in service were either irregularly paid, and even when they're so irregularly paid, we're not being, we're paying, we're being paid peanuts. Mm. And um, there had been a lot of um, uh, private sector participation that came into 
um, bridge some of the gap that isn't there, but uh, they are limited as well with what they can do. We have a very um, uh, big um, gap uh, in, the mic in the private sector. You hear those who pay very, very high, and you hear of those who come into the very, uh, very cheap pri pri private schools. So all of them, there's been a, lo a lot of effort to do address that. So what, when Manla Madamu and the Ministry of Education did this uh, uh, ministerial uh, plan, action, mm. action plan, I, I, I happened to be chairman of TED Fund at the time and participated in producing um, what, what we thought would be the roadmap going forward. And as soon as we won a second term in office, we set about hitting the road with it. And that's what, uh, in practical terms, we are trying to solve. Because what you've said is true. Mm. Um, teachers have been, you know, more or less, um, people hear of teachers not being offered accommodation in homes. They will say, uh, this house is for rent, but not for teachers. Um, you'll hear about young boys or young men who are in colleges of education not seen as viable husbands. So we, we, we took all of that into context and realizing that this can't be sustainable. I mean, if any nation must grow, the quality of its teachers, because it is that what you have within you that you impact on the next well person. absolutely because and i mean my, my next point was going to be to ask you how important are teachers and the role of teachers in the achievement of not just the national education goals set by your government but the national development goals because i mean you you talk about you know buhari talks all the time about being one of the 20 most advanced countries in the world or aiming for that. I mean, you can't do it if you don't have a proper education system and the people who impart that education are the teachers. Exactly. Um, you're, you're, you're almost speaking like Mr. President because you see you are, yourself and Mr. President share the same focus because Mr. President has said consistently, this is where we are going. Yeah, but since he came and into office... This is what he's doing. We've had innumerable strikes. Yeah, and, and, and the strikes are because, you know, the government is not doing what it said it was going to do. The government is doing exactly what it said it would do. It asks everybody to please get teachers paid properly. Most of the teachers you hear that are on strike are actually teachers in the payroll or on the payroll of state governments. Now... There's a problem with that. The country is a federation. Right. And because we run subnationals, once you release their monies to them, you have no way, except their own houses of assembly is willing to check them. And we know that that's not happening. But right. T but we've, surprisingly, uh, we're getting a huge amount of cooperation now, lately, in the second uh, part of this administration, of uh, getting many state governors to now work with us. Yeah, but yeah. let's not just blame the state governments because you've got federal tertiary institutions okay, and, well, and, and some of those people yeah, are striking. Yes, yeah, yeah, but I need to explain to you right. that there are about 113,000 primary schools in Nigeria, right. none of which is owned by the federal government. Okay. We only make laws and regulations that relate to them at the federal level, the right. legislature, ourselves, and in the executive. Through UBEC, we fund them. Okay, now, let, let that, me just yeah. ask you, I'm really sorry to interrupt yeah. you. We're going to come back to this point, yeah. but I must take a break or it will cut us off. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat about how teachers are treated in Nigeria. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Now, World Teachers Day is a UNESCO initiative which was first held in 1994 and is today celebrated in more than 200 countries around the globe. Historically, this annual initiative aims to acknowledge the contribution of te uh, teachers make to society, address the global teachers' shortage, and improve the quality of teaching. Nowhere more so, perhaps, than in sub-Saharan Africa, where education standards remain comparatively low and the conditions of work for teachers across the region, including here in Nigeria, are very poor indeed. Latest figures suggest that most teachers in Nigeria are demoralized because of the low wages they receive and the lack of acknowledgement for the important work they do, which is partly why the Nigerian government has marked this year's World Teachers' Day with award ceremonies and parades in honor of the country's teachers. The teaching profession is the greatest profession in the world. Having a special day to celebrate the teacher 
is just but a token gesture of recognition to the sacrificial contribution of teachers. And that is why for us at the Federal Ministry of Education, we are desirous to entrench quality teaching with emphasis on efforts to train, retrain, and reinvigorate the teaching profession with the best amongst us. There are numerous reforms and strategies that are being designed to strengthen the teacher. This includes improving the reward system. The picture of a teacher in Nigeria between the 1960s and 70s was that of a smart male or female figure, always moving around with a cane, wore starched shirts and skirts on a well-ironed shirt with a tie or a blouse, well-polished shoes, carved hairstyle, and a very stern but friendly mien, whose look connotes discipline and fair. That teacher often knew everything as well as the solution to everything. And uh, the man you saw there speaking in that video, the Nigerian Minister of State for Education, Chukwemeka Mwajuba, is still with me here in the studio. I'm sorry we had to take a break earlier, but would you say that teachers in Nigeria are facing more or less challenges today under the Buhari administration than previously? Well, you would admit, I admit that uh, teachers um, for a long time were ignored. Uh, no concrete steps were taken to uh, bring this up. And, and like that I includes the, the first term of President Buhari? No, no, no. Buhari. In the first term, these were the things that we met on ground and we challenged them and began this process that has culminated in this uh, package of incentives that you now see today. Because all of them, like I said, be they teacher's insurance, the way the teacher uh, going to be rewarded, um, uh, new um, age brackets for teaching, and the need to attract young persons to take up teaching and incentivize it a little bit, a bit more than it was uh, done previously. Where uh, these are not things you when you are still running for an election, you mm. do. Immediately we came into government, we hit the ground trying to repair all of this. When we found where the uh, stone wall did exist, we tried to go around them. Yeah, but the uh, point is that you didn't announce these in new initiatives until almost five years after his administration. No, 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 no. no. Some of these initiatives right. have been in the experimental stages. All of them, mostly everything that you heard today, we tried them. So some failed. Some of the things we, right. we, we tried to do failed. And so we didn't... Well, tell them. us what you announced okay, today. Now, well, Remind well, us. Well, you, you, let me take you through this. In sure. order to attract the best brains into the teaching profession, the policy of encouraging the best graduates to take up careers in teaching is hereby restored. Government has, as a matter of policy, is going to go back and say, all our best graduates, please, we want you in teaching. Mm. Whatever it takes. Two... The reintroduction of bursary, bursary um, to pay somebody for going to school is now reintroduced for university and colleges of education at the same time. Now, the assurance of automatic employment follows that. There's that no is way a bursary to train yes, teachers. Yes, for to train right. teachers. Okay. So we, we, we want to incentivize our best brains to go right. and learn this. So let's, we're, not, we're no longer going to tolerate a situation where... Well, that's a good initiative. Uh, yeah, but well, we don't want... Uh, education or teaching just mm. be left for those who can make it any other place. We don't I might know. consider going to teaching now. Myself. That's exactly what we want to do. <laughs> now no, I'm just kidding. We want to then do stipends for bachelors of education students as well as granting them automatic employment when they come out of school because mm. we want to place them in anywhere we can find. Then we've also asked TED Fund to get back to its uh, board. The board of TED Fund with, with, with the new board will now have a wider allocation to institutions offering education for teaching practice and being able to support through that same fund the teach the teaching methodologies mm. that we adopt so that only best brains can come to the well, uh, classroom but what about we, the people who are already teaching we, because because part of the complaint yeah. is that many of those we're, we're coming to that I, okay. I, i'll get to that i'm, right. I'm trying to look okay, at that's fine uh, Go government ahead, policy because go, go, yeah. government is a continuum government right. is planning for its future and how to get everybody working now there's an enhanced entry point for teachers right now let's 
you, you leave university, you join at level 8. If you're a teacher now, you're going to learn, join at level 9. This is the way most countries who are serious about education attract the best efforts in that direction. And what's the financial difference between level it's 8 huge. and level it's a step, 9? It's a whole great level. I mean, you, you, you're not in the civil service, so you wouldn't know how important well, tell, it is. Tell us how important <laughs> it is. A, yeah, there's a huge gap of nearly a 15,000 naira by month. Right. Yeah. So, and, and so, if you look at the next point that behind that, you see uh, the teaching program. So, if you are an outstanding student or a scholar, you now have an incentive to join. That's what this is. You have a 15,000 yes. naira incentive. incentive. Ahead of your peers. Right. You start off ahead, we're ahead. Now, we're going to have a special salary scale for teachers now. Like I told you, these were things we had experimented with. We have SDGs. Uh, goals. We have UBEC teacher development. There are a lot of schemes around that the government had been tinkering with for the past five years. We did experiment with, and now we see what works and what does not work. And so we now codify them into a policy statement. That's, that's just the difference. Right. Now, we're going, apart from that, we're going to have a special teacher pension scheme. You see, there are private pension uh, operators, and there is PTA. There is also pension schemes. Now we want to work teachers into a, a special pension scheme, so that your life Pensions and you can take out an insurance based on that. Every, like I said, if you were, if you had what Teachers Day last year, I did speak to a couple of all of these things. But um, I had just joined the ministry, so we wanted it to become a proper policy document, right. not just experiment. And now it's policy. And now it's policy. That's, right. that's, that's, that's and, and what the percentage yeah. of the because part of the complaints from international organizations has always been that a lot of African countries including Nigeria, the recommended percentage mm. of their national budgets that they should invest in education, they're investing a lot less than they ought to. What increase in that national budget for education have you now made from what it used to be as a result of these new initiatives? Well, um, you, you, you see a dramatic expansion, but you need to appreciate that most of these recommendations um, from 26% to education sector, or the same way we've recommended 15% for the states, they are, they, 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 they are quite, it, there's it, what you call a di distinction without a difference. Right. Because if your economy is a very small economy and you allocate X, Y, Z, what does that mean you allocate? If you don't make the money, what do you allocate? You allocate nothing. We, we need practical steps. Those are no recommendations. We are now dealing, like I told you, we've done, the Buhari administration came on board, decided to tackle all of these problems head on. All. He didn't choose some problems to tackle, not to tackle. It came, we had a zero budget. There was no money there in the coffers. Everything. But he went ahead. So right now, it is now sure-footed because he now knows what works, what does not work. He's now codifying a pension scheme for teachers and isolating that from this, but using the parameters that are already available in the law. We have to take a break in 30 seconds, okay. but keep going. Now, well, so, now, if you create a career path, this is the, uh, the, 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 the eight item on the agenda. We now created a, a new career path. In, in which way you can come into this education sector and decide you're going to be just a teacher. You're not going to be going into administration. So they, we have categories for people so they can concentrate on what they do. They, so these things are career patterned. We also have a teacher conversion and ICT program. Okay, let me, let me ask you to present, hold present that. Good, we're moving people from uh, where you are. We give you a six-month okay. uh, course. We'll, we'll talk about that when program. we come back. Okay. Please stay with us. Okay. You're watching The Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with the Nigerian Minister of State for Education, Chukwe Mecca Mwajuba. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Arise interview, where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anyegolu. Now, the government here in Nigeria has ordered the reopening of all schools. They were shut in March as part of measures to reduce the spread of the coronavirus. The number of COVID cases has come down considerably to an average of less than 200 a day, though in the last week or so, there have been reports suggesting that infections have soared once again again in Nigeria. According to official figures, between September the 23rd and October the 3rd, the number of new cases rose by more than 100% from 1,053 cases to 2,142 new infections. Correspondents say the increase in the number of new cases is perhaps evidence of poor compliance with safety protocols, which include the observation 
of social distancing rules and the use of face masks. They say the figures may rise further if such rules are not observed, especially with the resumption of schools across Nigeria imminent. And the Nigeria Minister of State for Education, Chukwemeka Mwajuba, is still with me here in the studio. Thank you for staying with us. Let's finish what you were saying previously. Yeah. Um, you were talking about insurance schemes and all the uh, initiatives that are being taken for We did teachers. announce today a couple of uh, schemes around uh, almost 20 I I I items, which are now an integrated factor. We announced um, a change of the, um, the age of retirement. Mm. We've added another five years. You don't retire 60, you retire 65. We, we want to keep good teachers as long as we can. Mm. We want to actually also enjoy their experience. We've also expanded and allowed them to stay 40 years in service. Mm. So this is a way from just civil service. We can allow them to get 40 years in service. There, there, there's a lot, really, considering the debt of uh, teachers and uh, how much we want to do that. Then the conversion scheme. If you have a single honor in physics and you're a bright guy there's, and you really would love to teach, we want to offer you a conversion program. We want to make you an ICT person. We want to, we want to use our digital uh, schools around Nigeria. There are five, six of them around the country. We're working with Ministry of Communications or even on our own training schemes. They just come in. We'll give you a six months pedagogical um, um, uh, training on it so you know how to teach. Well, because Teaching has two components. One, the knowledge, and two, the ability to deliver mm. it. And those, maybe you now have knowledge of physics, but you don't know how, to, how it's delivered. This is the point where we step in. We're doing all of this for free. We just won't bring everybody and then put everybody uh, to work. But the point I had made earlier, and which was why I was trying to explain to you that the education is first at the basis. We wanted to deal with basic education in the way basic education needs to be dealt with. Because it provides the foundational skills with which you can then learn anything else, including become as proficient as you are. We you mean as you are. as you are? But what I'm just saying, if we are able to do this, mm. the handicap we face is that that area is in the hands of subnationals. And we've been um, working assiduously with them to get some complementarity along the lines of what we said we want to deliver. And everybody is getting onto that page now. And that's why we want to review all of this and get teachers to them. We think. Nigeria is a huge country. Mm. The idea, education, which is the main purpose of any country, is to develop its manpower. As, but they are not a human Absolutely. resource. A, a population is not a. There's a whole world of difference between when something is a population and when it's a human resource. Mm. When you take a population, educate them, they become human resource. And that's the job of the Ministry of Education. Then you have manpower. Then you have the kind of things you need. Mm. And to provide the basis for that, is to provide basic education and to make that a basic education profession at what it is they must use it for next. And that's I, what I absolutely agree So we want to that. recruit a gang, mm. a massive number of young men and women to drive this. There are, we have two million, with two, about 2.2 million teachers registered in Nigeria. Some of them are exiting the system, but we need new ones. And we need new smart ones. Absolutely. We're not just new, new ones. One of the best brains. I would... Uh, we've suggested that we pay our teachers as good, better than anybody else. I mean, we want to attract who is best because it's from the best you can share a little of what you have. Absolutely. That's all we are thinking to do. Well, and I, that's why I, these initiatives that the president has approved are, are like a 100% score in, on every count. Everything he's done is 100%. You, you can't fall because it doesn't matter what structure, where you are mm. in Nigeria. You need this manpower. Well, to, to be honest, listening to you talk, it's very, very inspirational. And, and sounds very positive. And if I was a, a young man getting out of school right now, I would be, and thinking of where I'm going to get a job, I'd be looking to you and hoping that you're not going to just say the words and then subsequently let me down. Because the one thing I've noticed about Nigeria is that everything is always one step forward, then two steps backwards. I mean, teachers, you were making this mm -hmm. point when you were at the, uh, the Eagle Square today with this uh, World Teachers Day thing. I mean, teachers and the teaching profession used to be highly respected in Nigeria in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and even up to the early 80s. I mean, they were held in high esteem. What happened to reverse all that? 
Well, historically, um, for some of, you, some of us who studied this, because uh, someone like me who studied everything in Nigeria, my first degree, my PhD, mm. everything in Nigeria didn't go anywhere. So I know that from the beginning, what we did and what we've had in Nigeria was an engagement. Right. That engagement was overtaken way in the 80s when um, oil came in and suddenly teachers were no longer the sinusure of everybody's countenance. So uh, appeal moved away in some direction and people started looking for greener pastures elsewhere. Teachers weren't role models anymore. Uh, they, I mean, their word could not be taken. You have young people come back from some country and they tell them they don't know what they are talking about. But before, they used to be the focus mm. of communities. They used to be the go to guys they write your letters they the world has changed but but, but what we're trying to do is change the teachers to adapt to those changes right. and that's exactly what they need to become it server they, they, they need to be on whatsapp they need mm. to have data well, that's why we've asked mtm airtel and all of them who are who've offered us a complimentary bouquet that we're going to offer all our teachers their free data i mean you should be entitled to data for life so that you can be able to uh, at, at all times because it's it is in our all joint interest mm. our teachers are everywhere no, they're absolutely. ubiquitous i, I and they absolutely should be, uh, agree and, with and that. knowledge is is not um stationed anywhere mm. uh, knowledge is available everywhere so you should be able to be as ubiquitous as knowledge is mm. and with nigeria coming to the era of knowledge bank then with nigeria coming into the knowledge of searchable knowledge around everywhere mm. then the integration of knowledge across board by everybody playing in different fields whether it be in the tvet field whether it's in, the, uh, in, in regular administration in every form because w the tools for work vocational education mm. uh, skill sets everything is now taught um, I was, my daughters make beads. They're, they're, my, my daughter is a, is a lawyer, but she makes beads. Mm. This, she picked this up, and my kids also, uh, because all of them are here, they also interact with their family. So the country has changed. We need to, we're changing with it. Our mm. job is to move the rest of the country along those lines so that we precipitate a, a, you know, a culture of excellence across board. Well, that sounds e extremely dynamic. And now, of course, Nigeria and the rest of the world mired in a global pandemic. Has that made teachers more important because they've had to help students adjust to things like distance learning as well as adapt to COVID-19 safety guidelines in the classroom? Great. Um, you, if you followed our work with uh, the uh, presidential tax force, mm. we've been at the forefront. First of all, we, schools are the bastion of um, our intellectual base. So what we did was first shut them down. Mm. And having shut them down, we went into tinkering them over these past six months, working with them to make sure that all this, everything that, that is known mm. is shared. The NCDC, the uh, uh, Federal Minister of Health, all, everything that they could uh, possibly produce, they sent to the universities and to our colleges. Now, the colleges themselves and the universities have reacted. They make their own hand sanitizers. They've adapted their schools. So um, in the past six months as well, you see me crisscrossing many schools across Nigeria, almost on a junket. And uh, many people in those government colleges are not very happy with uh, my discoveries at the schools because I, I've gone around and mm. say, look, this is not happening. This is how normal schools should be. This is not how I want... Uh, I, I don't own Nigeria, but I am serving the country at the moment. Absolutely. So it's my job to bring everybody running at the yeah. same speed. Absolutely. And um, whether it's in Kauzare, in Karnamoda, anywhere where you're there, I want the schools to be up and running. And this is the challenge for our teachers. Because I go to each of these schools and I'm screaming and I'm shouting and I'm saying, I'm going to shut down this school if it's not up to par. Teachers are sympathetic to what I'm saying because they also recognize that we've given them these schools to manage. Mm. And if they don't, uh, then it impacts ne negatively on our students. Because in some cases, they are the mothers and fathers you know. Mm. So really, how optimal they use our resources is how optimal Nigeria gets benefit for them. So my job is to drive them, uh, not too hard, but drive them as much right. as I can. Get them on yeah. the Get right on path of rectitude. So teachers have done a great job in this period. Right. They, they, we, we, we've concluded WAIEC without any... Uh, major uh, incident. We are now we've done concluded NAPTEB exams, the, the, the business and technical skills examinations. We concluded. We are, we're just concluding. Uh, we're beginning NACO today. So we we are excited at the work teachers have done. They've mm. actually put in their best and uh, put themselves in harm's way, risk way, whatever way to make sure that our kids. Um, move on. Right. Now, now we now want them to come to the stage with the same enthusiasm right. for the next phase of it as we reopen all across board. We've warned everybody in compliance. We want 
parents to strictly listen to our, to listen to our teachers strictly and comply with the things that we've provided. We don't want these spikes mm. to be as a result of our own carelessness. We don't want even any spike at all. But nothing should happen that has le is as a result of us leaving gaps. Yeah. In what well, we, we've we got parents. about three minutes before we have to take another break. What I'm curious to know is, I mean, it, it's one thing to say these things that you're saying, and obviously you have the best intentions for the schools. But on a practical level, a lot of those schools are overcrowded. I mean, the dormitories and so on, I mean, you know, the places the, the kids live, the hostels, the classrooms and that kind of thing, they're overcrowded. I mean, how are you going to maintain the essential rules of COVID-19 prevention in terms of social distancing and all that sort of thing in those circumstances? Yes, you see, uh, what we've done is uh, pass all our managers or principals and um, uh, pr uh, school headmasters through our guidelines. We've centralized the national response and asked everybody to um, walk around it in reaction to how specific those apply to them. Right. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, in some places, you will find the need to either have classes in the morning and in the afternoons. Sometimes you have different departments. If some universities have not opened because we're asking them to work out a regime, for instance, of which departments that do not have the same GS courses with others who need to come to staggered use of the facilities mm. so that we don't have this sort of crowding. In the, in the dormitories, we've now asked some people uh, to choose if they want to be day students and borders, you know, so that we have, once that actually is made, the mathematics around each of them is, uh, you know, uh, added up, the principals can take decisions at that level. We, because the Ministry of Education has formatted an SBM, uh, uh, Schools Board Management Program, around so that it's not just us talking. Mm. We want parents to be participants, we want old boys or um, uh, old girls, as the case may be, to be participants in the management of their school. We want an interactive community-based management of all our facilities and institutions. I mean, uh, uh, we, we can't just keep building. We want managers at the local levels to be able to uh, participate and, uh, and, uh, and address them. So we, we may not be in a position to say, I'm telling you, you must do this and only this. No, we don't want to run a unitary uh, system. We want, to, uh, we want to run a united government, not a unitary. Because what we want to do is produce a governance framework mm. and allow every integral part and uh, per person on, the, on, that, on that platform to then make inputs as to how they can conveniently use them. Yeah, but we're That's talking about a pandemic, doing, yeah. though. We're not talking about sort of people in, in a relaxed... I mean, this is a state of emergency. No, yeah, yeah, but you must have local adaptations for all the specific uh, the general rules we've provided. Because what we found is that if you have a, a, a school that uh, attracts a lot of people, you, you, you should be free to decide whether you can make them uh, afternoon classes as well. Mm. You should be able to say, I want a junior student to come in the morning. But you're, you're comfortable school. that yeah. the schools, the, the people who run the schools, have understood the things they have. They have. We're okay. working in conjunction with all the commissioners of education. Okay. Fact, I'm at every Zoom meeting, they, they open up, they tell us what okay. it is that they want to do. Let, let's take another break and we'll come back and talk more about this. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with the Nigerian Minister of State for Education, Chukwemeka Wajuba. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Now, as you probably know, many students in Nigeria have not been in school or to class since March when schools were closed to try to contain the spread of the coronavirus in the country. Questions have been raised about how effective the measures schools are being told to take to minimize the risk of transmission of the virus will be. Education is, of course, compulsory in Nigeria, and the government has said that parents can be reassured that the measures will be effective. Some education experts say it's a moral imperative that young people return to school because the risk of not being in school outweighs what they say is the small risk of being in school, particularly given all the control measures. But fears have been raised that given how overcrowded many public institutions of learning are in Nigeria, it may not be possible to properly enforce social distancing rules, among other guidelines. 
well, the uh, Minister of State for Education in Nigeria is still with me in the studio, Chukwemeka Mwajuba. Thank you very much indeed. And you were you, speaking sir. before we went on break, and sadly I had to interrupt you to take a break. Um, but you were, you were talking about the, the whole idea of, you know, overcrowded environments in schools and how you've advised schools to adapt to that. Yes, we have asked schools to take measures to uh, ensure physical distancing. If it needs uh, cascading classes or having them report at different times, they should make those adjustments and we'll work with them along those paths. We think that um, parents and um, all other uh, participants in the education field are as much responsible for what's going on and how the country should be managed as ourselves. Really, we are mere managers on their behalf. Government mm. is only as good as its own people, and we want that kind of participation and correspondence. And um, uh, my job, um, uh, it's really a very difficult job of jumping from one school to the other and being on the road for almost 24 hours every day, just going to every one of them, because we really want them to be up and running, due, mm. duly uh, participating at every point. So we, 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 we know that it's going to be a tough job, but we know that somebody needs to do them. But you can have everybody working on them. Right. You concede and you agree that yes. the lives and health of students could be endangered if the safety protocols you put in place are not properly mm. adhered to. We, 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 we did emphasize this, mm. that under Chapter 2 of our Constitution, the President recognizes that his priority is the safety of life and property of Nigerians, especially their health. And that is why we shut the schools in the first place. And the president insisted, and if you listen to Malam and Amadam when we asked the schools to open, mm. we said, because we've done consistently over the six months, now assure her that we are not about to throw our children in harm's way. That is our priority. We don't want any school opening. There are two schools who have applied and we said no. We've already refused two schools who did not comply mm. with, the, with, with what we're saying. Some people may not believe what we are doing, but this is a country and this is a government. So we're going to keep enforcing that. You must abide with the protocols. You must provide them. I, we don't really care how much inconvenience or how much inconvenience you think it is to you for your child to wear a mask or, or, or don't wash your hand. Or, don't tell us that. Just follow the rules first. Mm. If we find out that you're not following those rules, well, we have to deal with somebody. And we've done that already. You've heard that I asked uh, a teacher, to, a principal to be taken off and uh, sent off. But, uh, but those are just disciplinary measures. And I actually believe those are the steps we need to keep everybody in check. Well, that sounds impressive. But let me ask you this. Some other big issue that is still on the boil at the moment, and that's the academic staff union. Um, who have complained that the government has not taken responsibility for the schools to meet COVID-19 guidelines. Many universities and schools, as they said, overcrowded in classrooms and so on. What's your reaction to that and the fact that they said they're going to continue their strikes? Perfectly. I mean, ASU is well within its right as a union, mm. as a union of lecturers. Now, they are perfectly within their right to air their opinion and try to take it one way or the other. But we didn't start out a strike with ASU on the basis of COVID. Yes. This, ASU was already on strike way before COVID. Mm -hmm. They gave a warning strike, and just before COVID, we shut down the schools, they now gave an indefinite strike. Okay. What was their strike about? They wanted to improve conditions in the universities. They wanted to improve conditions for lecturers. Beautiful. There is nobody who does not want that. The president would, at the drop of a hat, do that. That is acceptable. There is nothing. We are not in any contention with uh, ASU. Mm. ASU said they don't want to be paid by IPs. The federal government says we want to pay only by IPs. You can leave the employment of the person you want. You can leave. It's, it, the government is actually not holding anybody to ransom. It says, this is how I want to pay. I want to pay by IPs. You can opt out of it and say, I do no longer want to teach. You can find other professions. Uh, what we need now, probably more farmers. But I'm just saying that you can't keep forcing your employer. I will like you to give me my money through my pillow. <laughs> or I would like you to pigeonhole it through this mailbox. 
The man says, I want to pay you through the one that I've already paid for. They've already purchased a software. And this software, they're using it to pay everybody What's else. What's complaint about this? Well, they have a lot of complaints. They have a lot of um, um, disputations around it. Mm. And I think that is legitimate. But that does not foist yourself upon your, the man who has this money. The federal government came to this election. They won. They were voted into power on the basis that they wanted to fight systemic corruption. Mm. They didn't want an opaque system of payments. They forced everybody to take up this, including civil servants, including yours sincerely, who was appointed minister just a year ago, and I have to take my pay from IPs. So, right now, every university lecturer is mostly paid by IPs anyway. Because while they said they didn't want to get on IPs officially, federal government requested for their BVN to be able to pay them their salaries because federal government, this president, uh, he has a how he just loves everybody because there was no reason to pay them because they had declared a strike, they had left school, they didn't want to teach. But the president decided in his magnanimity that this country belongs to everybody and that in the midst of the pandemic, everybody ought to be paid. Mm. And he said, pay them their salaries. But we didn't have a way to pay them. So we had to request the universities to implore them to bring their BVNs. When they brought their BVNs, we migrated them into IPs. Now they are all paid. So um, up to July, I think uh, everybody's been paid. So I think they're being owed maybe August or, so, or, or the September salary. I'm not sure which one. But as it stands, the federal government is capable of paying everybody. We don't have this IPs controversy anymore. If you have any problem with how much you got or how many, or what your entitlements were supposed to be, right. you can complain about that. That's a legitimate complaint. It happens in the Ministry of Agri. It happens in the Federal Civil Service. Anywhere else, people complain about what their shortfalls or their things. And they are adjusted from time to time because like all software, we are not, they are not leaving things. They just get, get evolve. But there are other issues that IP, um, uh, as you started the, 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 the strike with. They started with teaching uh, needs assessment, uh, what we are supposed to do with the universities. And I agree, that is a continuum. But to think of 48 months in the last eight years that ASU has been on strike, it's decimated the public school system. It's, it, it, somebody would think they are paid to destroy the public school system so that private universities can benefit. Well, somebody would think that it would be an issue of extreme urgency to the federal government. It is. I'm, can't, can't you see I'm talking? Mm. I'm talking because my kids, I have four children in, in Soka, in the food, they are at home. I'm the Minister of Education. My children are eating more food than they are eating normally. And I'm saying, please, can somebody do me a favor? Asu, can, I, can you just do me a favor? Take these children back mm. to school. I don't have a problem with them. I, yeah, my kids, they're my kids. I love them to death. But I don't want them to be at home forever. And, they, and this is a phenomenon parents are facing nationwide. Right. Okay. And they want Asu to, whether, whatever, for whatever it is you're complaining about, get back to the schools. You've been at home for almost one year. Just get back and teach. Whatever it is that you teach, however you do this, get these things working. Okay. The work of getting the government working is the responsibility of ourselves okay. and us. Minister, I want to thank you very much indeed. It's been brilliant talking with you. Very enlightening, very interesting. The Nigerian Minister of State for Education, Chukwemeka Mwajuba there. That's it for this edition of The Arise Interview. Join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.